Ho Sang, so long. That was awful. That was terrible. That can't be the start of the show. Show starts are getting weaker and weaker. It's Joe Palan. Welcome to another episode of the Hockey Talk Show. This is another quick hit before we do live shows. Again, make sure you're following on Facebook and YouTube. And don't just follow and subscribe, but make sure you're getting the notifications so the moment that we go live, you can join in on the hockey conversation. Speaking of hockey conversation, there is tons, too much surrounding the New York Islanders right now as this afternoon, a very surprise move in sending Joshua Hosang back to the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. They reassigned him. He had four assists in six games to the start of the season. He was a healthy scratch in two straight games. It looks like he wasn't going to be part of this upcoming road trip that the Islanders are on, Minnesota and Nashville. Doug Waite and Garth Snow deciding, let's get him down to Bridgeport to play some games. It's sound logic, but here's the problem. Islander fans are just flat out hungry for this kid. You have a little bit of a lineup situation with the New York Islanders right now. And when you tout prospects for so long, and you do nothing but talk about this guy and that guy's going to help here and this guy's going to help here. And then you're finally on the cusp like fans are just dying for it. You know, they're just dying to see these guys. And the New York Islanders have this issue in two you know, several places, really. But most of the guys are in the lineup. We've been dying to see Anthony Beauvillier in the Islanders lineup, and he's there. Matthew Barzil is one of the fastest skaters I think I've ever seen in an Islander uniform. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other speed. Jason Blake comes to mind. You know, uh, Claude Lapointe early on was super fast. Um, but uh, Barzil, this kid has got a lot of skill and a lot of speed. A lot of speed. Uh, closest thing the Islanders have to Connor McDavid speed, and it's not Connor McDavid speed, but it's the closest thing the Islanders have, certainly is uh, Matthew Barzell on a team, which, by the way, looks like they're moving in mud most nights. You know, I mean, John Tavares is a beyond superstar, but not really known for his skating abilities. You know, Anders Lee a little bit slow. Uh, Josh Bailey, amazing moves, but very slow. Uh, they're not speedsters. They're not slow, slow, but they're not like you know, where this game is moving. Barzel is where this game is moving or Barzell is where this game is moving. And um, it's good to see him up. The two frustrating points for Islander fans right now, and this is why they're going crazy all over social media is Ryan Pulak and Joshua Hosang. Like we've been told about these guys. We've seen these guys in Bridgeport for so long. We know how talented they are. We know that there's a little bit of, you know, rookie getting to know you, learning the systems. They're going to make mistakes, defensive lapses, which you don't really want with a defenseman in Pulak. But uh, we know there's going to be those things. But I think most Islander fans are willing to suffer through them. Now, I don't expect Doug Waite to want to suffer through them. But I think we all expected them to be playing a lot more, specifically in the case of Joshua Hosang. Now, Ryan Pulak never really got a ton of playing time in the preseason, he got playing time. You know, he was there. Um, but Joshua Hosang was not only playing, but playing a lot in the preseason. He was playing a lot. And the fact that he's going down to the minors now, I think is pretty surprising to a lot of people. Now, you'll hear a lot of the pundits, and there are a lot of great Islander ones, by the way, and I follow a lot of them, and they all do a tremendous job. Everybody from Arthur Staple to uh, Brian Compton to, uh, you know, um, uh, there's just a Chris Botta. I mean, there's just a ton of great Islander pundits around, um, you know, that do a really good job covering the team, giving opinions and letting Islander fans know what's happening. And I think they're all trying to preach patience and they're all trying to preach like, look, it's no big deal. And when you get down to it, it really isn't a big deal. You know, look, when you have players that are waiver eligible, that they can be sent down, they don't have to go through waivers. You send those guys down. You don't send the guys down who have to go through waivers because then you lose a contract for no reason. So I get it from that standpoint. But I think everybody needs to understand the frustration of Islander fans here where we want to see these guys. And I don't think it's... I. I just want to know what's going on with Joshua Ho saying that he was sent down. I understand Pulak's been a little bit of a disappointment on the defensive end of things. We all know he's got an amazing shot. 
We all know that he's going to be a really big point producer one day. Guy's got a frame like Shea Weber. Where's number six? I mean, like, he just looks, he looks the part. He's big, you know. Um, I'm not saying he's going to be Shea Weber, but, but you know, a, a guy can dream. Uh, certainly something that he can uh, try and uh, live up to. Uh, but, you know, I understand him setting out. They even did this weird thing to get Pulak in the lineup where they went with 11 forwards and seven defensemen. And they did that for at least two games, if not three games. So, you know, Doug Waite really trying to get Pulak into the lineup, get him to spark the Islander power play, which, again, is not off to a great start this year. And they, they sacrificed enough to go 11 forwards and seven defensemen. I hate that. And then I looked at the games and I was like, this kind of works for the Islanders because it wound up giving John Tavares some more shifts. I noticed that Brock Nelson was picking up some more shifts. They were juggling lines a little bit more. You know, the centers were playing with different winger combinations. I think it was a good look for the Islanders. I don't think you can do a whole year like that. But it certainly was an interesting experiment for a young coaching staff that is in that area of let's try anything right now, which is where Doug Waite and his staff is in this his full, full first season as a bench boss. But I just want to know what's going on with Joshua Hosang, because you can't sit there and tell me this guy's the next uh, coming, you know, and play him a ton in the preseason. I can see him contribute in the preseason and... And then he's a healthy scratch. I mean, he didn't make the opening night roster, which was strange in itself. And then he gets into the lineup and you're like, okay, that was a little weird, but whatever. Uh, maybe, maybe coach wanted him to watch a game from the box and, you know, ease him in a little bit. Seemed a little strange, but whatever. And now he's a healthy scratch again. And now it's two games in a row. And now he's, Back riding uh, buses in the AHL. Now, by all accounts, and again, all the great pundits that I just named, and by the way, I think they do a phenomenal job. If you don't follow them, you should. Arthur Staple, Brian Compton, uh, Chris Botta, who's gotten back into the the mix a little bit. And there's so many others at Islanders Point Blank and uh, Andy G. I apologize. I don't know his full name, but they, they all do a tremendous job. Really, really fill everybody in on what's going on. Uh, they're all preaching that, hey, this isn't going to last too long. Even Arthur Staple wrote a piece in Newsday, which is really the only major paper that covers the New York Islanders anymore, uh, that they are going to, they don't see this being that long, and they'll bring him back up, uh, which is fine. I'd rather him down in Bridgeport to get playing time than sitting, you know, and not getting playing time. But what is it? What's going on? Like, what is it about the kid? Because I look at a struggling power play, and... You know, here was a guy that if you watch the game tapes on Joshua Hosang, he actually could bring the puck into the zone on a power play. You know, a lot of teams do this stacking four or five guys on the blue line, and it makes entry into the power play damn near impossible. You know, there's five defensive players between the red line and the blue line really slowing down entries on the power play. Uh, you know, and they did this weird entry thing where somebody would carry the puck up to a defensive player and then drop it back to Hosang, who would then pick it up and just go just barreling through the zone. They were doing it with Barzil as well on the power play. You know, for a team that struggles on the power play, you want to carry the puck in the zone. You don't want to dump and chase, scrum and fight for it because it's easier for the other team to just throw it down the other end. So puck possession on the power play is super important. And you have this kid who seemed to be really damn good at it and he can't get into the lineup. Now, the other weird thing about this, and I, and I think it was maybe a little bit of a rookie mistake on the part of uh, Doug Waite. You know, look, it's his first year behind the bench. He's going to make some mistakes. He's going to make some errors. Uh, but when the season opened up, and again, we're talking about Joshua Hosang here. When the season opened up, Hosang sat and he said that he was going with Chimera instead of Hosang. And that was his decision because he was going with experience, which, by the way, I mean, I have zero problem with that. I mean, zero problem with that. I get it. And, you know, the Islander Nation sort of exploded and they were like, well... Chimera is this, and Hosang, you know, again, you promised us Hosang, he's here, why not play him? 
I love Jason Chimera. I mean, I don't understand anybody who doesn't. You're talking about a fourth line player, third line, fourth line player who scores 20 goals. Do you know how valuable that is? Do you know how valuable it is to have somebody with the experience that Jason Chimera has with the speed that Jason Chimera has? Again, he doesn't have, you know, Connor McDavid speed, but the guy's got speed. He can kill penalties. He can take up, he plays valuable minutes. I mean, you, you kill for a guy like this who could jumpstart a breakaway, who can put 20, 20 Go! I would love, and I don't have this sort of statistical information. Maybe Eric Hornick does. But I would love to see time on ice versus goals and points of him and some of the star players in the league. Because for the amount of time that he plays versus the amount of time a Tavares plays, you know, or a Crosby or a Mount. I mean, you know, amount of points, percentage of points per playing time has got to be tremendous for a Jason Chimera. Now, look, I know he doesn't get a ton of assists, but he's exact. He's a third and fourth line guy who scores 20 goals. If you have a player like that on a team where Tavares is putting in 30 plus, Anders Lee is putting in 30 plus, Eberle is putting in 25, 30 plus, uh, Ladd is putting in 20, 25, maybe 30. You're talking about an all-star scoring team here, a team to be reckoned with, which is what this Islander team should be. So I don't know why, maybe it was just the combinations in Doug Waite's head where he was literally deciding between Chimera and Hosang. I don't know why he had the need to call out Chimera there. I think it was a rookie coach mistake. I think it was a mistake that a Mike Babcock or a Ken Hitchcock wouldn't have necessarily made. Not that it's a huge mistake, but he could have just said, you know what, Joshua Hosang is going to sit. This is the lineup we're going with. I went with a couple of more of experienced guys. I don't know why he had to call out Chimera and let everybody know that that was the choice that had to be made. I didn't think that was the right move. But I love Jason Chimera, and I think there was a lot of unfortunate feedback against him, which I didn't think there should be. I think that was pretty damn unfair for Jason Chimera. Now, I want to bring up Cap Friendly here because I'm going to bring up a point that I have been screaming about for quite some time now. Uh, which hasn't been on the record, and I'm going to put it on the record now, but it's funny how you start to see people evolve and talk about this, and I feel like they should have talked about it a hell of a lot sooner. Jason Chimera is not the problem with the New York Islanders. The problem with the New York Islanders and getting a Joshua Hosang in the lineup is Kuhlman. This guy's the problem. Now, when Kuhlman came here and he was signed, it was a package deal with Mikhail Grabowski. They were going to come in, this Russian connection. These guys were super close friends. They had put up some decent points when they were with Toronto. They wanted to play together. The Islanders had space. It was a move I would have made at the time. I can't kill Garth Snow for this move. It was a little bit much money. Everybody knew it. Garth had to do something. That was what he was left with. That's the move he made. It is coming back to bite him in the rear end now because Kuhlman is making $4.1 million. Look at it. Look at it. $4.1 million the guy is making. Yeah, let me move that over for you so you can see what I'm talking about here. Here's my man right here. Here he is. Look at him. $4.1 million. Nikolai Kuhlman's stats are not statistics of somebody raking in f almost $4.2 million. He's just not that kind of a player. If you look at his uh, last season, uh, he had 12 goals last season. Nine goals the year before that. 15 goals the year before that. And that was his best year, his first year with the Isles, where he was getting a considerable amount of playing time, far more playing time than he's getting now, far more playing time than he deserves now. Folks, Jason Chimera is a 20-goal scorer making $2.25 million dollars. Jason Chimera is the steal of a lifetime. The man is the steal of a lifetime. 
27 is not the pro well, he's 25 25 is not the problem that would have been so good if i didn't flub that damn it i'm gonna take off five uh show hosting points for that little flub right there 25 ain't the problem it's 86 why is this cat in the lineup explain to me now you take a look at the uh, new york islanders lineup and uh, let's just call it what it is it's a pretty decent lineup not a lot of people give it credit not a lot of people think they're going to make the playoffs. I certainly think they're going to be heavy in the mix, more so than the Rangers, maybe even more so than the Canadians. We'll have to wait and see. Tavares, Lee, Eberle, fine. They move Bailey around. He's actually having a career year, but be careful. It's a contract year. That's why he's hustling a little bit more, I think. Uh, Barzil's up there, Beauvillier, Nelson Latt. Here's where you have the problem right in here. Here's your problem right here. You have four fourth-line players. By the way, these two, 53 and 15, Clutterbuck and Tzizekas, top-notch quality fourth-line players. These guys are the man. These guys are part of the best fourth line with Matt Martin was here. They deserve to be here. They are tremendous. By the way, Cal Clutterbuck, also a 20-goal scorer, a former 20-goal scorer. I would like to see Chimera with Clutterbuck and Tzizekas. To me, that's the fourth line that I'm dying to see. That's the fourth line that is going to really... Kill penalties, win your games, I mean, take up good ice time, not get scored on too much. I love that line. I don't hate Nikolai Kuhlman. I think he's a good player. He's far overpaid for what he is, and he's taking up a roster spot right now. And on top of all of this, the reason why Twitter Nation is going crazy, if you really want to know the truth, you have Alan Quine, who is a fine, serviceable player, who is now going to apparently be with the team and Joshua Hosang isn't. So Quine can draw into the lineup, but Joshua Hosang can't. You got to explain that to me, because if you have Hosang in this lineup, now for what I understand, I think that Quine is going to go to Bridgeport as well on a conditioning stint. But if you have Hosang in this lineup, and you have Chimera down here on the fourth line, you've got a Nelson Ladd Hosang line, which I thought played really well. You've got Bailey, Barzil, and Bovillia. You, you now have three fully offensive lines that could, could be contributing and helping you score goals. And what does this guy right here want the most more than anything? Number 91, help scoring goals. That's why Andrew Ladd was brought in here. That's why, uh, you know, uh, Jordan Eberle was brought in here. Because the other guys weren't scoring enough. And these guys are supposed to be the guys that score some goals to help keep 91 in that blue and orange for eight more years and $100 million more dollars and whatever the hell the guy's going to wind up signing for that he deserves every last penny for all the aggravation that he's got to go through on this team. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And you know what? I understand that you send... Uh, I understand the moves. I just want to just get it out there why everybody's frustrated. We want to see this kid. And I know the coaches eventually are the ones who have to answer the questions. It's they're, they're the ones who get fired, not the fans, you know, at the end of the day. But I don't think anybody's going to be upset if, you know, Hosang costs the team a goal here or there. Because I think the guy's going to wind up being more of an offensive positive than a defensive liability. For Pulak, I can't really say the same thing. I haven't really seen him a ton. I mean, he looks okay, but I haven't really seen him all that much. But to me, I want to know what's going on with Hosang because I fear that it may be something else. I don't know if he's still, you know, listen, remember last year he got he got excused from uh, camp the first day because he was late. You know, there's been some issues. He's got a bit of a tude. Everything he's done to me says he's doing the right things. You know, he's doing this charity skate thing. He's got a coat drive going right or clothing drive going right now. He's trying to collect clothing. He's doing all the right things to me, so I want to know what it is, you know. And you can say, look, Ant, you're wrong. They're doing the right thing, blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you where I can kill this organization, and that's in the communication. If you're going to send down Joshua Hosang, then you know what? I want a statement from the general manager or the head coach to go along with it. Don't just tell me he's been reassigned. Tell me he's been reassigned, and this is why. I want to know. And if you don't want to tell me the truth, truth then damn it make something up okay if you don't want to tell me well you know he was late or you know it was this or it was that if they're protecting him for something hey i get it 
I understand how an organization works. I used to work for an NHL organization. In fact, I used to work for the New York Islanders. Um, I get all that. I understand that there needs to be some protection from the public. The public doesn't need to know every last detail. But that being said, don't tout your high prospects on me and then send him down after he sat for two games and not give us a damn reason. Give me a damn reason. I want to know. Say, look, we got it, it, it. You know, we're on a three game winning streak right now and we just don't want to tinker with the lineup, but I don't want him to sit. So we sent him down. Give me something. Give me something because you've been touting this guy to, to us for years since he was drafted We've seen the, uh, you know, all the videos online. We lost a year of them because he was late once for opening day of camp, which I'm not going to say it wasn't the right move. I get you got to get your guys in line. I'm, I'm going to back you up there. But you can't just bring along all this hype. And then when things don't go right, say nothing. Quick hit on the New York Rangers here. Adam Cracknell, who the Rangers acquired from the Dallas Stars when they put him on waivers, have now put Adam on waivers and he has uh, been sent down to uh, Hartford. Uh, looks like nobody wanted to claim him this time around. Uh, Cracknell uh, was with the uh, Rangers, uh, what, for about, uh, well, since sort of the beginning of the season. Uh, he had a good season a year ago. He had been held scoreless through the first five games, one for Dallas, four for the New York Rangers. And now he is uh, with the Hartford Wolfpack. Uh, tough goes for uh, Adam Cracknell. It's got to be tough, too, for the Rangers when you scoop a guy up off of waivers and then you put him on waivers and then uh, nobody claims him. You got to be thinking to yourself, are we the only ones interested? Well, apparently so. Maybe there was a couple others, but after he goes four games scoreless. I don't know what's going on with the Ranger lineup here. Is it Benajad, Nash, and JT Miller? I don't know why Matt Zuccarello is not up on that top line where he belongs. That seems a little suspect to me. Rangers still have a lot to figure out, but they got a good chance to do it as they take on the Arizona Coyotes, who are 0-8-1. Haven't won a game yet. Ah. I don't know about this move in Arizona. They, I mean, they don't even look good. They're a young team. I get they're going to go through their growing pains, but they don't really look good. They're young guys. Look okay. They had moments with the Islanders. I watched that game pretty close the other night. I don't know what's going on there with Arizona. I just don't know. But I'll tell you what, Ranger fans, here's an opportunity for you guys to pick up an easy two points and a win that you desperately, desperately need. Now, the rumor mill has been going absolutely crazy, and most of this has been uh, following the uh, name of Alex Galchenyuk. Uh, a lot of people chiming in on this. Let's go with uh, Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman, who reports not a day goes by without a trade rumor involving Montreal Canadian struggling forward Alex Galchenyuk. If he's dealt now, Friedman believes it'll be for pennies on the dollar. He thinks the Canadians would move Andrew Shaw, potentially keeping some part of his salary. Shaw has four seasons left on his contract at 3.9 annually, and trading term isn't easy. Shaw is a Stanley Cup champion. Guy knows how to score goals, and he's a tough third-line player. Again, like Jason Chimera. Hard to come by those guys. And if anybody, you know, you look at the Stanley Cup playoffs, those are the guys that wind up coming to the forefront and being super important. And that's what Andrew Shaw was for Chicago. Don't know what's going on there. Doesn't make sense to me that Shaw would go. Uh, Brett Kurgillis, my apologies on the name, is linking Galchenyuk with the New York Rangers, saying the Rangers are stumbling through the uh, tough opening of the season here. Gergillis points out it's difficult for the Rangers to absorb the 23-year-old's 4.9 million annual cap hit for a player who's never proven himself at center. The position the Blue Search need the most. He also points out the Rangers would have to send some salary the other way to take on Galchenyuk's cap hit. Uh, Kent Wilson, in his latest Calgary Flames mailbag segment, took a question about Calgary acquiring Alex Galchenyuk. This is what happens when you have a superstar and you put him on the fourth line. Um, Galchenyuk for Sam Bennett, he says, makes sense for both teams on paper. He's not sure if he'd make the move just yet. Uh, Bennett is something of a mystery box right now who could become a difference maker or a mediocre player. Galchenyuk is slightly older, offensively capable, but suspect defensively. Here comes some serious allegations right now. Uh, Jean-Francois Chumont cites former Canadians coach Mario Tremblay 
told 98.5 FM Montreal's Mario Langlois, and by the way, they did this in French, which is why we don't have the clip, that Galchenyuk twice, re- this is, and I, let's just, these are some serious allegations that I'm about to drop on you here. I want you to know these are the, uh, these are the words of Mario Tremblay, and I'm sure they can change. But he says that Galchenyuk twice received treatment in the NHL's drug and alcohol program. Neither Galchenyuk or the team would comment about the report. When Galchenyuk was asked about it on Tuesday, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it's important to note here that a player who takes part in the uh, substance abuse program has the right to do so on a confidential basis and isn't obligated to inform the public, obviously, or even his team. It's a serious business. Uh, if Galchenyuk did receive treatment, Mario Tremblay's remarks could be considered a violation of the confidential confidentiality policy. If he didn't, then Tremblay is going to have a lot of explaining to do because that is a serious allegation you levy upon somebody. Look, I, whatever your beliefs may be, it's widely considered to be a disease nowadays, and you can't just go outing somebody for having a disease. Uh, that being said, if it's not true, that's a serious allegation to levy against somebody when you don't have the absolute facts. It's not something that should have been said in public. Mario Tremblay is wrong either way. That being said, now that this is out there, um, and it seems allegedly that um, Mark Bergevin did comment on this somewhat. You know, he said they asked him about Galchenyuk in a press uh, conference, which I'm going to play a clip for you here momentarily. Not this part. I'll just surmise this part for you here. But they said that you know, look, he. He's been he's been looking for answers, and he's going to continue to look for answers. He goes, he's been looking for answers outside. Now he's just got to look inside. That's kind of what Mark Bergevin said. I think he's trying to handle it with class. I don't know if he's talking about substance abuse or drinking alcohol abuse. I don't know, but uh, you know when I fir- it's funny when I first heard Bergevin say this in the press conference, I kind of thought mm, he's talking to other hockey people, like he's talking to his old coaches or. Maybe he's got a coach on the side, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of these guys talk to their college coaches or their junior coaches or, you know, whoever, they still talk to all those guys. Like when he said he was looking for help outside the organization, I thought kind of that's what he was talking about. And then I heard this uh, bit of news from Mario Tremblay and, and maybe that's what he was referring to. No way of knowing until you really directly answer Mark Bergevin. But if I had a guess, Mark Bergevin's not going to tell you either way anyway, nor could he, if he knew. Uh, but that's, you know, that would explain, there's definitely something stopping Alex Galchenyuk from becoming the player that everybody believes he can be. And it's interesting that, you know, pennies for the dollar was thrown out there because in the press conference, and I don't know if this is in the clip that I'm going to play for you here, but in the press conference, um, Mark Bergevin does make reference to, uh, pennies on the dollar. He does say something to that effect, which I found to be uh, pretty interesting. So uh, there is that to consider as well, that uh, Mark Bergevin is hearing what the rumors are. And uh, basically this press conference that was called this afternoon, which you're going to hear him talk about right now, he came out and he said, I'm not making any changes, you know, which is kind of what we said was going to happen anyway. You know, we said, I said when we did the trade rumor show, which by the way, you can go back and listen to we'll, Maybe we'll link it in the YouTube and or the Facebook uh, comments, uh, or we'll put a card in the YouTube show here. Um, but um, you know, it's worth pointing out that I did say this in the trade rumor show that Montreal's going to have to do something. They are an incomplete team, but don't count on them to do anything anytime soon. It's far too early. I said, look for the twenty game mark. Um, and that's what they're going to have to wait for. I, I don't really foresee anything happening there. And if they continue to putter along on this, you know, just under 500 mark, then you can put it to, you can push that 20 games to just before Christmas, because there's really not going to be any reason for them to make any sort of moves like that. Uh, so here was uh, Mark Bergman being asked about it and sort of addressing the fact that, Hey, I'm not really making any moves. This team's not going anywhere. These guys are doing what they're doing, and that's what they're going to be continuing to do. 
Well, yeah. I mean, again, that's reality. I mean, you 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 do into a tough stretch. People want to pick your pocket. You know, some guys are better than they're playing, and what you're talking about getting in return, it's not going to help you. So just to make a move, just to make a move, that's not going to make any difference. I mean, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make a move just to panic, say, listen, let's do this. I'm just not going to do that. I mean, like I said, and I told these guys, the answer is in that room. You know, it's in that room. Coaches are, are working hard every day, spending hours, you know, and we watch tapes and we see where the breakdowns are. And sometimes they're the smallest breakdown, and it's in our net. And then it affects your confidence. And it might not be what people like to hear, but that's reality. I've played, you guys, I think, well, you all know sports, a team, you could play with a bad foot, a bad hand, but with no confidence, it's so obvious. And that's what's happening right now. And, and I hope, and again, last night was a perfect example. The start of the game, they could have scored five, five, ten seconds in. Why? And then they score, we go down, can make a play. Then two, two goals later, it's a different team. And they carry over in the third. That tells me it's not the skill, it's the confidence. And that's what they need, and I believe they will. All right, so there you go. That's uh, Mark Bergevin talking about confidence and skill, and they need the confidence. Look, everything he said there, it's not that it's not true. Um, And I don't want to be like, he's just making excuses, because it's a press conference. He's got to give an answer. I don't know. I don't know. Should that team be better? It should. Uh, but Brendan Gallagher has been a, an underachiever for a while. You know, um, he just has. Uh, you know, Max Pacioretty is your guy. And let's be honest, between Pacioretty and, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Carey Price. He's been masking some of your real issues. You know how when coaches say, you know, you win more from a loss because of the win. You ignore all the problems you have. When you have a world-class goaltender like Carey Price, you tend to, you know, and he's stealing you games. You tend to ignore some of the problems you have. And the Montreal Canadiens have a lot of problems right now. They don't have a top-line center, which Jonathan Drouin is supposed to be. I don't know if he is or not. I think he's a good, skilled top-line player. Um, whether he's a center or not, that top line centerman is a tough position. Look at everybody in the league who it is. It's Anze Kopitar. It's Sidney Crosby. It's John Tavares. You know, it's Jonathan Taves. You know, I mean, you gotta be, it's almost like, it's almost like the cleanup hitter in baseball. You know, you know who the cleanup hitter is on your team. You know, you just, you just know who it is. You know, you can make the, the case that the, the pitcher is like a goaltender, you know, because it's they're kind of alone in that spot. But the the clean the, the cleanup hitter is, you know, that's your first line center. It's it's an important position. Your top line center and your your top D man, your you know, your Drew Dowdies and your Shea Webers, you know, these are important parts of if of the uh team. I mean everybody's important. You gotta fill the team out. But you know, your top line center does a lot for your team. And uh, Jonathan Drouin is unproven. He's highly skilled. I think he's going to have a great year. Can he do all the things that a top line center can do? Can he get back on that back check? Can he go down low behind the net, be in the dirty areas, fighting with the top centers and forwards on the other team, and then get back on his horse and get back up the ice to find some open ice Battle in front of the net. Battle, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just, it takes a certain type of player. We get to see if it's Jonathan Drewin. I'm not saying he's not. I'm saying that, you know, he's unproven. We'll just wait and see. Andrew Shaw's name is coming up in trade rumors now. That seems really strange to me. Philip Deneau, Max Pacioretty's great. You know, Thomas Placanic, Brendan Gallagher, Alex Galchenyuk. These guys are supposed to be scorers. Why aren't they scoring? If you get these three guys to go, you're good. You'd be all right. But if you're not, you're not. Uh, Lekkinen, look, I don't know too much about these guys. You know, Paul Byron doesn't really seem like a top-line player to me. Maybe he is. I don't know. Um, you know, they got a bunch of young guys in there. They just gave up Sergeyev to Tampa, who's doing well. That doesn't... 
you know, that doesn't uh, help their cause. Not that I wouldn't have given him up. I would, I, cause you need Jonathan drew in, but, uh, it doesn't help their cause. You know, it doesn't really help them out all that much. But uh, what Mark Bergevin is trying to say is, hey, this is a confidence thing. No. The one thing I will back him up on is you can't go ahead and trade Alex Gilchenek for Sam Bennett and then expect, like, <laughs> the Canadians to take off. Like, it doesn't always work like that. You know, it doesn't always work like that. And like you heard him say, you know, people are trying to pick your pockets. He is probably getting bottom line awful offers right now for Alex Gilchenek. He's probably getting the lowest of low. And, you know, you don't make a lot of money in the stock market by buying high and selling low. You got to do it the other way around. You got to wait for the right time. Mark Bergevin wanting to wait is the right thing. You have no other choice. You just don't. It'd be great if you can call somebody up to spark your lineup. You know, it'd be great if you could, if you did have a, you know, the, the best case scenario for the Montreal Canadiens is a change of scenery deal. But take a look at my man, Mark Bergevin here. I mean, you know, he's going to wait. Here's a guy who knows he has some explaining to do, calls this press conference, and he just, uh, you know, he knows he's got to uh, wait. He's got to wait it out and see. And you know what? By the way, the other part of this, too, is I like the move in the case of, like, he's going to come out and say, look, I'm not trading these guys. Don't think that that's not a move to try and spark this team too. Like to say, look, they're not going anywhere. I believe in these guys. These are the guys. Because that's what happens to these teams. They start losing. They can't figure it out. They do lose confidence. And the trade rumors start happening. And then you, then you, then you start hearing things like, you know, such and such a team called asking about this guy, such and such a team called. And then you're like, oh my God, am I going to get traded? Look, these are human beings too. They, they, most of them don't want to be traded. It's a bit of a process. Imagine if you walked in your job and you're like, yeah, uh, hey, hey, Phil. Yeah, you're going to be, uh, look, we'd love to have you here. Thanks for everything you did. Uh, I know you got your family here and everything like that, but we're sending you off to Edmonton. And you're like, what? I'm an accountant. How could you? Yeah, yeah no, no, listen. We traded you for a, a couple of secretaries, this young accountant just out of college who's like really got a ton of potential. And um, photocopy machine that we really need. You know, you know, like you know what I mean. Like it's just these guys are players too. You know, there's emotion in being traded, even if things aren't working. When you're traded, it, it's 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 an emotional process. So I don't think any of the guys want to go anywhere. And I think that the manager coming out and speaking up and saying I'm not sending these guys anywhere should give them a bit of a spark. Should get them to come around. And uh, try and play a little better, try and spark something that can get a little bit of a better result out of them than what they have been getting, you know. So I think that it's good that he addresses the team, uh, addresses the media like that. And let's be honest, I mean, he's in Montreal. He doesn't really have much of a choice. Things are going wrong. You got to say something. Two, six and one for Montreal. It's not the end of the year, but they have got to figure out something and figure out something fast as far as goal scoring goes. You know, the problem is, is, you know, Galchenyuk scores and everybody gets all excited and you can't get too excited over one goal. You're supposed to score one goal. You know, you're supposed to be moving on. It's a bizarre world for some with Montreal down at the bottom there. And how about your Vegas Golden Knights Starting this year off 7-1, and one, best start for an expansion franchise in the history of the National Hockey League, plus eight on the goal differential. They are even with Los Angeles. They are playing just as good as the New Jersey Devils, who are a surprise. Something I think that we're going to be tackling in the next couple of shows is Vegas legit. Now, I said at the beginning of the year, and I still contend to this, because everybody said, oh, look, they're not going to be as bad as Columbus was and Nashville was and Atlanta was when they started in the league. They made sure to make the rules different so they could have a more competitive team. But even that being said, I think most people thought that they would finish last in the league or close to last in the league. I picked them to be a little bit higher. I picked them to be middle of the pack competing for a playoff spot. You can't tell me that you have March or so who you only have to see if he can score 30 every year, but he has scored and he proved he could do it in Florida, which is not an easy feat. You have James Neal who would have a chip on his shoulder and you have Mark andre Fleury, again, chip on his shoulder. 
He's just a great world class goaltender and two thirty goal scorers, plus a, a lot of young guys and a lot of excitement being in a town where you're new. And on top of that, which wasn't, you know, uh, originally in the original plans, but that horrific tragedy that happened, which really pulled them together really quickly and really made them want to give something back to that community. You know, really sort of they took that as an inspiration because they were right in there. They met with the first responders and they met with victims, families. The hockey players are great people and they really, I think, helped them drive. They really wanted to make that town happy again and give them something to celebrate. And they've done it. They've done it. They have far exceeded everybody's expectations, even mine. I thought they'd be fighting in the middle of the pack. I thought they would. Again, Flory, the real deal, James Neal, March or so, some of these cats coming in. David Perron, you know, could score. Sure, he wasn't working out. and they, You know, but that's, that's those are the kind of guys you want to go into an expansion franchise to get a chance to play again, to get a chance to say, hey, I got I to gotta pick this up. I got to get this going. Um, and, uh, you know, they've just come out and done it and, and they've been impressive. So definitely something that we're going to look forward to in the next couple of shows. We'll figure out a time where you can carve out some time for the Vegas Golden Knights. Are these guys the real deal? Are they going to be in the top three for the rest of the year? Uh, my thought is, I think they're going to be a wild card kind of a team, you know, in, I'm not saying they're going to make it, but in and out of that wild card, I don't know if they're going to stand at the top of their division. But I could be proven wrong. Let me tell you something. If they get to 10 and 1 or 10 and 2 or 9 and 2, something to think about. You know, people say it's early, it's the start. I've said it too. We all say it. But when you get six, seven, eight games above 500, it doesn't matter if it's in the first 10 games or in the last 10 games. If you can rack up that many points, think about eight wins over one loss. Well, let's put seven wins over one loss. That's where they are right now, right? That's 14 points. You just scooped out 14 points out of 15 games. It's just as valuable now as it is later on in the season. You can go through and lose three games. You've still taken 14 points out of 15 games. That's impressive. That's impressive. Out of eight games, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Out of eight games. It's impressive. Uh, good on the uh, Vegas Golden Knights and their start. But are they the real deal? Something to contemplate uh, moving forward. James Neal, eight points in eight games. Riley Smith has two goals and five assists. David Perron with five points in eight games. So does William Carlson. Uh, Lucas Spiza, five assists. Derek Englund with a goal and three assists. Colin Miller. See, that's the thing with Vegas. They're getting it from the... Uh, they're getting it from the defenseman. Their back end is really helping out. I avoided saying they're getting it from the back end just there. That could have been a faux pas. I did point it out eventually, but I felt like I had to because that still it was still a little weird. Um, Brad Hunt coming up four assists in four games. When I was talking about Montreal looking for trade help, I said jump on the Vegas Golden Knights because they have puck moving defensemen and you don't and you need it. And that is a big reason why these guys have success. They got puck moving defensemen who move the puck out of their zone, get it into the offense, get it in front of the net for James Neal and March so and all these other scorers, put it in the puck, put it in their net a little bit themselves too. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, you know, they're just, they're an exciting team to, to watch right now. You know, they're a real exciting team to watch. I like what they have there in uh, Vegas. And I like this, uh, this uh, Alex Tuck. I like him. Four games, Two goals, one assist, three points. It's pretty good. He's off to a pretty good start. Uh, and a lot was made about uh, Shipasheoff uh, going down. And uh, I didn't think that he really deserved to be down, but he came back up. But I think he's hurt now, right? I think they put him on injured reserve. Yeah. So imagine what they're... And, and we should also mention this, too, that Malcolm Subban was out. But I think Mark andre Fleury is going to draw back in. We'll get into Vegas Golden Knight on an upcoming show. Uh, thanks for uh, being a part of the Hockey Talk Show. Again, if you're uh, listening on TuneIn, Stitcher, or uh, iTunes, uh, make sure you rate and review the show for us. That'd be fantastic if you could do that. And just be aware that the show is, uh, there's a video component to the show on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, you certainly can follow along on both of those. But don't just su subscribe and like. Make sure you follow and get the notifications. Hit the bell. Hit the follow button. Get all notifications so that when we go live, 
you can uh, call in and take part of the show. HockeyTalkShow.com is where we have all the other information. I've been your old pal, Ant. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you on the next shift.